time to kick it off. Uh, I'll just say a few words uh, at the start. So thank you everyone for you know coming and joining for today's IDS member seminar, um, which as you know is the the regular event usually once a week that runs at IDS to bring uh, interesting external and internal speakers to the fore. And it's a real honor and a pleasure today to be hosting Joshua Green, at least in a virtual sense, in the spirit of making the best, you know, of these pandemic times where it is possible to bring in people for virtual presentations from places like Mexico, where Joshua is based. So Joshua recently completed his doctoral degree at the University of Geneva in Switzerland on the human right to water in the context of water, water commodification and environmental destruction. And we've worked together on a paper as well on uh, water and microfinance. And Joshua has returned to Mexico since then to carry out further ethnographic research in areas that confront extreme environmental contamination and violent crime. Joshua's presentation here today will take us to Western Mexico, to the banks of what may be one of the Western Hemisphere's most polluted and dangerous rivers, and the industrial town of El Salto, where residents are dealing with a water crisis which they're trying to manage through resorting to <coughs> water. And now this is clearly a market-based, individualized, and possibly quite unsustainable response to a wider crisis of social reproduction and a collective failure to manage essential resources in the face of a form of industrial development which has created vulnerabilities and let many people into debt. And just to say a little bit about Joshua's background, which I think is a very unique background Joshua has, uh, he combines a decade of anthropological research in Mexico with another decade of work as a print journalist in the United States. And his work has focused on a wide range of topics, including poverty alleviation programs, agricultural subsidies, migration and community development projects. He's also helped to coordinate US-Mexico negotiations about the Rio Grande water management. Joshua, as I've mentioned, holds a PhD from the University of Geneva, as well as a master's in global policy studies from the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin, and a bachelor's degree in print journalism from West Virginia University. He's also the director of a development project, Recuperación de los Ríos, in Jalisco, Mexico, which brings water education and financial resources to small communities to provide access to drinking water and to construct low-cost wastewater treatment systems. So really, thank you very much, Joshua, for getting up quite early, I think, in Mexico time today to present today in IDS's member seminar series. It's a pleasure to have you here, and the floor is yours now. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Mader and Dr. Andrews, and uh, thank you for making this possible, and thanks for this opportunity for all of you who are attending to uh, allow me to share a little bit of my research. So, um, as Phil mentioned, yes, I was a journalist and I moved to Mexico. It was uh, quite um, disillusioning to find out that the stories of everyday life here were not of interest to uh, the, the publications I'd worked to before. And I, I found work as an ethnographer in, uh, in case studies and, and, and became uh, immersed in the culture here. And, and um, I found a wonderful uh, mentor, Dr. Norman Long, who had his uh, part-time res residence here. and. Uh, we became great friends, and I think I became one of his uh, last students in the in the last ten years here. He's he's retired and um, quite old now, but he's still a wonderful guy. But one of the things he mentioned was that you know one of the advantages of being in a foreign place in a foreign context is noticing the the unseen, noticing the the normal, and noticing the way that things become um, little by little. Uh, circumstances change, and for me that was always very strange here to to. to all of, to find that all of our drinking water was in a, in a bottle. And um, I found it as a, quite a profitable line of research. Nobody else was working on it. Nobody seemed to be uh, astounded by it. Astounded by it. And, and when I went to Texas, I did my master's looking at the global side of the bottled water industry and how it's uh, evolved and where it's come from and the ideologies behind it. And the big movements from the big capital uh, groups, you know, and this, this started really in the 60s when the first documents from Coca-Cola uh, circulated saying, you know, the future was going to be with uh, the diminishing quality, you know, the, the disrepair of the public water systems. And, and they really saw um, a potential. And there's a wonderful book about it uh, called Citizen Coke. Um, and uh, it talks a lot about uh, the industrial push for public water systems in the early uh, 20th century. And so it really was kind of a, um, you know, a, 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 
the industry-led kind of model, even though before it was a public system, it was still pushed by some of the industrial guys. But now they're they're sitting on the other side of it. And so for the masters, I looked at the, the, the growing uh, business and what it's doing on the global side. And then for the, the PhD, I really wanted to take it to the household and see what it was. And um, okay, so today I'm going to present to you a little bit about what I looked at, um, key questions and findings, uh, the theories I use, how we went about with the methodology. Um, I'll give you a case study, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll have some conclusions. In this picture here, you see a man, he's uh, got his only supply of water. In his neighborhood, uh, a local shopping mall came in and cut off his water supply. He's been 10 years without a water supply. And um, this is his uh, little bit of uh, buckets that he, he manages to get the, the water uh, delivered to him in. Okay, so um, jump into it here. So in this research, I deal with what I consider a futuristic situation. Now, this is a real world where pollution is extreme. Now, what we're looking at right now is the, the waterfalls in El Salto, Jalisco. This is um, the, 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 the discharge of about 700 international um, factories and all of the wastewater from the city of Guadalajara comes through. And it wraps around the city. And this is uh, water that's used for irrigation, for all of our wheat, for our... Uh, for our um, oats, for our grains, um, and it's quite a, quite a fertile area that this river passes through. Uh, right now, they're actually fighting for who gets this water, and they've, they've, we've, we've run out of water in the city. About 60% of the city now is using this as uh, their, their uh, household water source for the, in, the, in the dry period here. This is a very unusual situation happening right now. But anyway, so this is a, a real world where uh, pollution is extreme and safe drinking water is scarce and entire populations are reliant on bottled water, uh, sometimes even for bathing. And other sources of water are scarce and increasingly contaminated. And when I say it's a futuristic scenario, I'm reminded of the voice of one of the inhabitants who uh, compares this, this, this area, which is very violent, and um, you know, she compares it to the Mad Max Fury Road as... As a, as a warning of what, uh, what can happen if the rest of the world becomes like El Salto. Well, uh, I've seen the movie. It's not quite that extreme, but it's quite, um, still quite um, dramatic. So in this context, I, uh, this research takes place in, in, we're going to talk about Western Mexico, but my research actually looks at five study areas in Mexico for comparison. Um, and this is a country that what Arturo Escobar calls a particularly brutal form of neoliberalism, a state that exhibits clearly, <clears throat> clearly argue, the arguments of Sassen, Saskia Sassen, who shows a realignment of state power with transnational capital. And this is a state that has attracted some of the world's dirtiest industries, both extractive and productive, uh, suppressing wages and turning a blind eye to pollution. So one of the... Um, development models that Mexico has followed is, is attracting industry through low regulation and low uh, low wages. And this is this has been their model. So this is truly a, a frontier edge of our current productive globalized system, exhibiting completely the phenomenon identified by Colbert as the sixth extinction. If we think of the rivers of the earth as the veins of our civilization, then it becomes obvious what is happening, not just to us, but to the entire environment. And it brings us face to face with what Paul Crutzen first called the Anthropocene and Jason Moore calls the Capitalocene. And as uh, Solène Morvan Roux and I recently argued, uh, this research shows clearly the way the economic system steeped in a logic of individualism and competition preys on the most vulnerable. And at least partly, this is accomplished by invisibilizing the costs of our current paradigm. And I think um, one need only look at the recent list of uh, environmental activists who've been killed or trying to bring light or justice to these issues to um, bring the point home. Actually, one of the colleagues we work with is trying to bring attention to the river recently, and his car was firebombed in front of his apartment uh, just about a week ago. So, okay. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, one of the, the, the advantages of being a foreigner is seeing things that seem normal, which are really not normal. And here is uh, the International Development Bank's 2010 survey of consumption of bottled water in Mexico, showing uh, far outstrips everybody else in the world in, in individual per capita consumption. And, um, okay, so in, in this case, um, 480 is, is an average for the whole country. And what we see is kind of geographically separated. Their study showed that certain areas closer to the U.S., 
have very low consumption in certain areas further away um, have very high consumption. Our research in this industrial area shows that uh, average per capita consumption is about twice that, so about a thousand uh, liters per person per year, and um, and in certain cases it's even double that when they when they become uh, when they become uh, dependent on bottled water for bathing. Okay, so. Um, and it's also become very, very common for us to spend uh, huge amounts of time hauling water. This is not uh, the other day. I brought six of these bottles back to the house, and they're, you know, each of them are twenty kilos, so you know, um, two hundred pounds of water, you know, for for you know, which I have to take up a couple steps in order to have water for the house. And this is, of course, true throughout here. And and there's a large number of people engaged in the service. Um, I've seen a couple pictures. I have more. You know, the kind of the joke is, you know, instead of public drinking water service, you know, you get this guy. You know, this is the guy who brings you the water if you're in these neighborhoods. So um, <clears throat> we estimate after taking into account all the delivery men employed in the sector, and at least in communities where bottled water is an option, uh, residents spend an average of about six hours per year carrying large jugs of water. And that throughout Mexico, this highly ca capitalized version of modernity, more than 500 million labor hours per year are dedicated to doing what pumps have done for 4,000 years. So, um, okay. So after carrying out investigations into the global nature of the bottled water business, and particularly the Mexican model, the obvious question remains, you know, what does this look like from the perspective of the household? Uh, these working poor households, um, you know, these are, these are areas where families average about $35 per, 35 pounds per, per capita income per week. And, um, you know, we're seeing a large part of this going to the bottled water uh, model. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but what, what we want to see is what, how, do, how do poor families cope? What, what do they do? And in Mexico, about 90% of the population uh, is considered uh, poor, okay? So specifically, this is uh, in one of the case study regions. What does commodified water mean to this woman? What does this mean? And so um, the key findings from this inquiry um, or that this market solution offers no solution at all, okay? That, that uh, social reproduction is squeezed um, as access to goods previously provided by the environment and public services become accessible only through the market. Uh, surprisingly, we find on the local level that 80% of the supply is, is provided by these small uh, informal vendors and that these vendors are not professionals. They're not water professionals. They don't have any training. Um, they're completely uh, in it for uh, the livelihood aspect. Um, and the water they sell is unregulated. Um, in one survey we did 80, we, we visited 80 water shops in this region and uh, only one of them tests their water with any frequency. And um, anyway, so there's no safety protocols. There's very little state oversight. And um, this is what uh, uh, Bolins and others call kind of a an in informal state arrangement where the state is allowing this this key provision of water to 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 go on unregulated because it's actually a state uh, a state um, it's the job of the state to do it and they're not doing it and so there's, you know the big companies can't sell to the poor because uh, a bottle of the water from Bonafont or from Coca Cola costs about half of the the minimum wage um, the daily minimum wage here. So, um, and, and the final thing that we show in this research is that the, the market is highly subsidized and that there's these cash grants for the deserving poor and um, we find between 10 and 100% of their grants goes directly towards uh, uh, purchasing bottled water, which, you know, is um, an indirect uh, subsidy from the state uh, to provide the state services, but they're subsidizing this market on the bottom. And now this market, at least officially, not this 80% of the market that's unseen, but the official side of the market is about 1% of the GDP in Mexico. So it's, it's uh, about 15 billion uh, pounds a year. Okay, so, um, okay. so the, the key findings are that uh, there's no solution at all. Uh, and in this landscape, we see the working poor primarily relying on these small water providers, um, and that this is being, uh, you know, um, financed by the government indirectly. And that we also kind of show that um, through issues of debt and financialization and and 
water, all these issues are very, very integrated on the local level. And so um, one of the key aspects of this policy has been, uh, uh, this investigation has been looking at Mexican social housing policy, which shows that in the last 20 years, 20 million Mexicans have been moved into uh, housing developments on the periphery of, of cities where they don't have water access. So it's kind of a, uh, and, and this, they've been locked into it through mechanisms of debt, trying to financialize their lives, get them into um, long-term asset accumulation. And they move into these areas right on the banks of these, uh, this river. This is a, a key area of research for me where, where this river floods every year. Uh, they have 10,000 houses built right on the banks. And the, and the original studies of this uh, developer show that with 45 minutes of rain, this area would flood. And, um, you know, this was ignored. They put 10,000 houses down and every year they get flooded with the most contaminated river on the, on the, on the continent. Here. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's a mix of factors which come in preying on these, uh, these families. So my research focuses on the way this marketized access to water fits into the larger picture of commodification of new spaces and the expansion of financialized circuits of capital. And I think this puts into question the idea of limits to growth. And it necessitates that we deal with and prepare for unimaginable scenarios where the essence of life itself is commodified. And this is not in contradiction with the idea of planetary boundaries beyond which life as we know it is no longer sustainable. Right? This is, this is co uh, concurrent. Instead, it asks, what if there are no breaks? What if there's no breaks to the system? Where does it go? Okay. The bottled water paradigm necessitates for me staring into the void where concepts of ecocide extinction and the ideas brought forth by the collapse oligos are unfolding. And after getting to the edge of this void, it's very difficult to look away. These are uh, real people. You know, these, these, these households are, um, yeah, I mean, we, we become involved, right? They become friends, you know, and, 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 and um, it's hard to look away. So this research brings into focus territories which are uh, directly extracted from by globalized capitals in ways that create difficult living conditions and absolute horrific environmental conditions. And as capital pretends to double again, as it must under the growth paradigm, these extremes are becoming the normal. And so, uh, you know, one of the comments in Geneva I always had to defend was why I'm looking at these extremes, because the extremes are not the normal, right? And these, these are outliers in a way. But I think we can see that these extremes are becoming more and more towards the normal, right? I think I think this issues of contamination, the, the, the issue of the river flowing, you know, it doesn't just stop here. It goes to the next community. It goes all the way to the sea. And um, issues of decreasing surface water quality and access to safe water are increasingly global issues. And it necessitates ur urgent analysis. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my theory, which is where I really want to, to discuss things. And I hope we can. But in order to... Um, in order to frame and analyze this research, I look at a classical economist's and feminist Marxist argument about the nature and history of capitalist and the ecological economist's and ecological Marxist's argument to embed our social and economic theories into a theory about nature and to recognize what physical science tells us, that the world is, in, is finite and that our current paradigm puts our species and many others long-term survival at risk. And I also succumb to this idea of real power. My training at the United States Policy School, Presidential Policy School, indoctrinated me with, with foreign U.S. foreign policy, real power um, theory. And I have a, a very hard time escaping its logic, especially watching transnational capital penetrate these national boundaries. Okay? And, and I'm not convinced of the argument of a, of a liberal world which overcomes the anarchic nature of the international system. So... This is just the context. So I want to focus a little bit on my theoretical approach, which looks at the social reproduction of the household. And I use social reproduction theory. Uh, I was sent to a community 12 years ago in, in Chiapas, and we were told the poorest people in this community are the ones who uh, go to the forest and bring the firewood back home. And those were the people we should look for because they were the poor, the extreme poor. But when you got to there, you found out they were actually the, the most self-reliant people, right? These were the people who... who spent the day in the forest with their children, they gathered what they needed, and they came home. Now, 10 years later, it's illegal to do that. And so I was looking for kind of a theory that helped me understand how, how it is that the poor are no longer allowed access and they become marketized, they buy gas and they buy their firewood, and now they're no longer the poor. Well, they become more poor if you look at them, if you take it from their position. And so I really wanted to kind of, uh, and I, I've juggled with this idea of poverty, and it's really... Um, a difficult uh, concept to, to nail down. But um, 
Social reproduction theory begins by showing us the unpaid work that goes into keeping a family going and the work of women, the washing, the cooking, the teaching. But it also gives us a vantage point by which we begin to see the interaction of all sorts of other factors like public services and access to public social protections. As uh, Lena Levinas shows us, um, countries that have done the best to fight poverty are the ones that have the highest level of public services, right? So the least uh, marketized relationships for survival. So a formalized relationship of civil, civilization or citizenship and rights fits in there. It's a little bit tricky, but of course, rights allow us access to these, these services or to these wages or to these conditions. And what I really am looking for is, is to show how the environment is not just embedded in the social reproduction of the household, but the household is, is embedded in the, re, in, the, in the environment, right? And so I think environment uh, is, is a key factor of social reproduction. And I, this is really my next phase of work and my life's work is trying to show that, that this has always been um, you know, where social reproduction comes out of. And it's an unseen uh, free resource that's extracted from my capital, but um, it's also uh, what we're all embedded in. And so you know, it, it's in its absence that we show this, really. I mean, we can show it in the positive, of course, those who go to the forest and gather food, but also um, in the absence of, of a healthy environment. So what we're documenting now along the banks of this river is the, the loss of species, the loss of access to, to the goods and the fruit from the trees and the, and the fish and the frogs and the, the life that used to be and the quality of life that that gave also. No? Having the river not just to, this, this, this um, waterfall that you saw earlier was a site of, uh, you know, of, of pictures and weddings and this was a, a romantic scene you know, uh, 50 years ago. So all these factors, like the care work that goes into con the, continually in the home, are hidden uh, when our discussion of social reality hinges on the dualistic, frequently binary confrontation between labor and capital that's left at the level of cash compensation and payment for services or wages, right? So when we're just talking about social struggle, about wages and conditions of labor, we lose these other factors. And so social re reproduction theory for me continues to be necessarily tied to, to Marxist theory of production, which sees consumption of the household goods, the sale and the purchase of production as a key component that keeps <coughs> capitalism humming, <clears throat> right? We have to actually realize capital, so we have to buy it. So wages, you know, wages fit in there and social reproduction is, you know, a subsidy to uh, low wages in this way. And recognizing un unpaid labor as a factor which goes back into the creation of the worker, subsidizing the wages of the worker and allowing them to survive on the lowest wages helps us see what Harvey recognizes as spaces of anti-capital. Okay, so these hidden spaces, what he calls them, are anti-capital. And these are places such as the environment and the community. And he reminds us that while one tendency has been to try to bring these spheres of exchange into the formal economy through economic valuation, and I would point more to Cologne for that, but um, this inevitably leads to their being subsumed into the laws of the market and the drive for accumulation. In um, Noam Urim's uh, deliciously uh, wonderful book on money, uh, Money as Desire, he, he tells us that when we try to save the world or water or the environment by putting economic values on it, we actually simultaneously put the whole edifice at risk as money which sits outside of valuation itself represents more than any material good. So the moment we put a value on it, we actually put the cause at risk, is what he says. So uh, just to elaborate a little bit more on this. In, in, in contrast to the Marxist idea of the second circuit of, co of production, so the production of labor, which is uh, Leibowitz's idea that there's two per circuits of production. One's the production of goods, the other's the production of the laborer, which would see social reproduction as kind of feeding into capitalist production. Or, or perhaps a feminist reading, which would see social reproduction as being subsumed by capitalist production. I prefer an ecological economist approach, recognizing the social as a subset of the environment and the economic as a subset of the social. And in this approach, and in, and in my work, um, we make a strong argument for the needs to consider the environment as a, as a key factor in social reproduction of the household and society. So I'll, I'll uh, get moving through here. Um, so the methodology is based on ethnography. We, we actually came in, I, I uh, started this project by myself here and uh, working on weekends, looking for people. Uh, but very quickly, I was in, got hooked up with Selene Morvan Roux in, in, in Geneva and uh, we began working on um, kind of what we had resources and began looking at it on a larger scale. And so we had um, 
My original research was a small business uh, survey looking at water providers in a territory. Um, and then we picked another area to do comparison. Uh, we also had a thousand person uh, uh, survey, household economic um, and water consumption surveys. So we looked at all of their economic uh, history. And then I also went to um, Chiapas and we picked three indigenous communities that had different distances from, from a major city to see if, uh, if when we find extreme poverty, if there's any way to attract or if there's any, any relationship between these communities and bottled water. Because, um, you know, this, this, the, the, the push for this solution for, um, for drinking water suggests that we're going to achieve the sustainable goals, development goals. The United Nations now counts uh, bottled water as, a, as an improved access, so countries can attain the sustainable development goals if people have access to bottled water. So we wanted to see if that's true, if in, in the poorest communities do they have access, will these companies come and sell to them? Ironically, uh, nobody buys water when they don't have money, of course, but um, the Coca-Cola truck still shows up. So when we go to these little communities and we ask, have they had any grants from the government? Have they had any contact? They don't have internet, you know, they don't have cell signals. And so, you know, you ask, has the federal government come to help them fix their services? You know, this one community has water coming in from 25, um, 25 kilometers away. They're pumping water up a hill and it comes every two weeks. They get it in their houses. And so you ask them, have the government officials come to, to assess you? Have they come to, to provide you with resources? They say, no. You say, Do, have, has the Coca-Cola truck come? Yes, every morning at 10 o'clock, it's on time, right? And so, um, okay. So in, in our case, we did, um, I, I did 15 ethnographic case studies from this area and three in each of the indigenous villages. Um, key, key informant interviews, financial diaries were employed uh, and, and some big surveys. And so also, as I've mentioned, the, you know, one of the important features here is that um, other neoliberal policies are driving the commodification of water. So these are the, the no, most notable illustration has been the social housing policies, which since 2000, the year 2000, have moved 20 million Mexicans into these peripheral areas, mostly lacking basic urban services like um, transportation, schools, healthcare, policing. And so these have become, you know, peripheral areas. Actually, the area that I was uh, I've done most of my research and they've warned me not to go back because they're, they're finding mass graves and the narco, the drug gangs have taken over completely. And, and so, you know, these are, these are, uh, and this is social housing, right? This is housing for the poor. Um, and this is another picture of these uh, uh, horrible situations. Here's the, here's the houses flooded on an annual basis by this terrible river. And the people don't leave their houses. They're afraid because if they do, people will come in and steal all of their stuff. So they actually stay and 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 endure these um, situations. Here's here's a focus group in this community, which they say I shouldn't go back to now. Um, in 2018, after three months without water, uh, these are women raising their hands if they have to use bottled water for bathing. And these women are buying about uh, 30 or 40 20 liter jugs per week um, for their household needs and uh, obviously becomes quite an expense on their, um, and, and a prioritized expense, right? We're seeing it's like raises up to about 15% of their annualized income expenses, but it's not, it's not an expense they can negotiate, right? It's not one they can leave off. If they have to have water, they have to have it now. And so this is, um, okay. Uh, briefly, I'll give you a case study and then we'll wrap up and talk about it. Um, so here's the case of Pedro and Lupita. I randomly encountered these guys when I was knocking on doors in the neighborhood looking for community liaisons for the National Welfare Program. So the National Welfare Program here has traditionally operated with a community representative who is the organizer. And so you go and go to any community and find them just by asking around. And this woman, she took me in. She started to talk to me. She started to survey the women in her group to see how much, um, how much of their federal money was going to bottled water. And... As I came back to discuss with her again and again, it was clear that her own case was illustrative. And Lupe and, and Pedro moved into this federal so, social housing uh, project 20 years ago. And the details of their case reveal the way these social housing policies are uh, use financial inclusion and home ownership aspirations of the working poor to guarantee the financialized circuits of capital. So while the details are complicated, uh, we can discuss it, but in order to protect foreign uh, financial investors from the fluctuation of for foreign currencies here. Uh, these loans are not variable interest rates. 
they're set at about 12%, which is a subsidized uh, interest rate for us. Um, but instead of variable interest rates, we have uh, a principle that floats. So this is a very unusual arrangement. But basically, every time they raise um, the minimum wage, they tie these loans to, to the value of the minimum wage. And every time the value of the minimum wage goes up, the value of these loans goes up. And uh, Ray's reason, the quote shows that they've gone up by as much as seven times. Okay, so since these loans have begun, their their principal amount has gone up seven times. Okay, and, and this is the case with in, in, in this household. Pedro is semi-disabled. Uh, he was looking for work. He crossed a field, and there were some uh, uh, tailings from from metal processings, and they burned off his hands. His hands are, are uh, malformed, and his legs have lost. Uh, so he's unable to work, he's unable to use his hands. Um, now, uh, in this case, they've been supported by Lupita's meager, meager or earnings. So their mortgage, their payments are automatically deducted from her pay, which leaves them, has left them with little for food and expenses. But they would sacrifice for this house, right? So she would go and work and they would be left with something like 15 um, pounds uh, per, per week at the end of their payments and they would, you know, they have a family with, uh, I think there's nine people in the household. So Pedro would wander the streets, collect alms, look for recyclable metals. Um, and Lupita, Lupe was working for Hershey's, uh, Hershey's chocolate when she found out that her, re, her, her payments that were deduced from her, her salary had been robbed by an intermediary. They robbed all of us, she says. And after that, in order to catch up, their payments were increased. And so they were left with almost no take home pay. And so when she dropped behind more and more on payments, uh, she stopped going to work. Uh, it was no longer valuable to work six days a week in a factory and not have a paycheck. And um, when I encountered her in, in 2017, there were eight people in their teeny 40 meter home, including two of their own children, four grandchildren they're taken care of. And they were behind on their electric bill, their public water service, and they even owed their local water vendor for the water they had recently consumed. And in this slide, Lupe shows us that her social housing debt, which uh, we see here that the family purchased their house for about 6,000 uh, euros, and they paid about, um, I'll use the pesos, sorry. Uh, they, they purchased the house for 135,000 pesos. They paid 250,000 pesos over 10 years, and today they owe almost 800,000 pesos. So, you know, they're, they're completely awash in debt. And um, when I first interviewed her in 2017, they were spending about 9% of the household's income on bottled water and about 60% of their federal welfare assistance. In 2019, after experiencing kidney problems, her doctor urged her to buy the more expensive water. And today, her household bottled water expenses are equal to her entire federal welfare subsidy. And in this way, through the application of case studies and ethnographic field work, we begin to see the relationship between environmental degradation, financialized capital, and commodified social reproduction factors. And in Lupita's case, when we last visited the family, they were awaiting eviction. And our sources with the Federal Housing Institution say it's for the best because the debt had grown so large, far beyond the value of their home, thus it no longer even made sense for them to attempt to pay. Okay, so one of the key lessons uh, that I think comes clear is how often uh, it is not just uh, the system, right? It's not just some system that's organized against these people, but it's also theft and fraud. We see in the local, how you know the local level um, echoes something that David Moss tells us that poverty is also very much relational, meaning that it's caused by social relationships. And in case after case, it's clear that this unregulated landscape, where power rules and vulnerabilities are sources of accumulation, poverty is, as Moss suggests, is caused by other people. So um, just to wrap up here, this research what con confronts what I think of as the front edge of the capitalist system. And I think uh, the cases presented here um, and, and, and in my work um, show that the commodified version of drinking water has replaced the public drinking water paradigm. And, and where it isn't, where it hasn't, there's just nothing. In the case studies from Chanel and Chiapas, we see the community too poor to attract these vendors, reliant on pumping contaminated surface water 25 kilometers away from their home to their homes. And they get water once every two weeks. And in that setting, the only household I encountered buying bottled water did so because the contamination, they believe, killed their grandmother, the family matriarch. And so despite the arguments that I've encountered, I find no evidence that this paradigm is in decline or is a transitional phase or a state between undeveloped and developed. Actually, uh, we can talk about that. But furthermore, um, as the UN is now uh, giving more uh, 
credence to bottled water as a, as, as a, as a drinking supply, and they're tracking it uh, specifically in countries with similar governance issues, right? So I, I think the current cries for more public-private partnerships to produce higher than market returns in achieving the sustainable development goals suggests this highly profitable market will just continue to grow. So uh, with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joshua. Virtual round of applause for a really, uh, really fascinating, rich, ethnographic uh, study that you presented here. I'm sure it will have raised another, a number of questions. I certainly have questions about some of the financial aspects of what you presented, but I just wanted to, so, so, you know, I think we can just start taking questions. People could, if people could switch on their cameras, that would be lovely. It would start looking like an actual seminar room now. Uh, and I'm just wondering what people locally are doing to counteract these trends and tendencies that you've just outlined, perhaps even, you know, also the organizations that I know you're working with now. Once yeah. again, please, if you are here, switch on your cameras just and, and, and ask a question. Well, I'll, 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 I'll um, I'm, I'm continuously disheartened by the analysis here on the local level, which seems to think that if we just fix democracy or if we just regulate these industries, we will have a solution. And I think uh, we're at a crisis. And I don't know that there is time to wait for this new democracy to come about. Um, you know, we, I'm, I'm involved in many groups which try to figure out how to fix the, the, the government institutions which are over, over these, which have been hollowed out. You know, we used to have like 40,000 uh, people working for the Federal Water Agency, and now there's something like 10,000. And they're not uh, engineers anymore. Now they're business and, and, and accounting specialists. Um, and the wonderful work of... Um, uh, the, the guys in Wagenhagen and, and in the Netherlands have shown this quite a bit. Uh, Edwin Rapp and Philip Wester and, and others. And, and so I think, um, you know, we're in a context that, that we have to really understand, I think, the, the, the evolution of the state to represent transnational needs. I think that's here. Now, I think that that allows us some responses on the local level because, of course, transnational capital doesn't really deal with, um, you know, the... the heterogeneity in the, in the local level, right? And so we have, we have opportunities there. Um, I don't think um, many of the groups are confronting these, these, these institutions, are confronting the state, are confronting capital. And, and um, you know, their response has been violent. And it's not, um, it's not clear to me that that's, um, that's a possible direction, you know. And, um, you know, we, we go to little community meetings and six, 10, 20 people show up, but, you know, they want to have a big march and stop something. And it's, it's you know, they're, they're very much powerless and they're very much isolated. So um, I can tell you a little bit about what we try to do. We try to form little groups and try to have communication between them and try to solve local problems and see what, what we can do at the local level. But um, I think trying to address it from the higher level, I, I really struggle with this. I think it needs to grow from below, but that's my perspective. Hello, hello. Okay. I, I so, hope that you just have to bear the silence. That's no, that's, no, no, no. I'm not. No, I just, then people, people eventually speak up. It's mainly oh, it's a te the experience of teaching is you bear thirty seconds of silence and then somebody goes, okay, maybe somebody gets gets creative. Well, I can just keep talking. Of course, I just would like to hear. Uh, I know. Resist, resist the temptation. I have a question, perhaps to uh, get the ball rolling. So you mentioned uh, very briefly um, one of the uh, communities that you visited, you were threatened or you were afraid of going back because of uh, the narcos or perhaps the threat of violence that you might face. I was wondering if you could expand on that. I mean, what were the, the reasons behind that? Were you, was it because you were studying this thing and they didn't want you to? Or No, 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 no. It doesn't have anything to do with me. It's just, um, I don't think, I hope. It's... Um... No, it's just the state. The it, it was already a very violent um, region, and um, you know they've they've found a number of mass graves this year. We're already in the in the hundreds of bodies that you know these uh, you know stashed in one of these houses, you know buried in the backyard, and um, you know so what happens is the conditions are so brutal that, that large percentages of these these areas are abandoned by the people. They just can't. 
Um, there's no transportation, so they move to the periphery and then to come back into the city, it's several hours uh, to go back to their former jobs. So they leave in the earliest hours. There's not enough buses or even roads to get them back and forth. And, and you know, so the, the communities are abandoned by the workers during the day and there's no schools locally. So the kids become, um, you know, are attracted by the local gangs. Uh, the drug uh, trade and, and the violence uh, in Mexico is very high. And, uh, and so these become kind of uh, nests, nesting areas for criminal organizations. And, and um, so it's always kind of advisable to kind of do field work in these areas during the day, you know, from 10 to 4, uh, and try to pack out before, um, you know, and we've gone in in the evenings to drop someone off or to, to um, but it's certainly uh, not a place you want to uh, leave your car. And, and so now what, what I've been advised is that recently the, the gangs have become much more uh, tense and that not during my, my field work before, but, but at this moment when I've sought to go back in um, and, and, and carry out more uh, individual case studies in this area, um, they've, I've been advised to, to take it easy. So um, it, it, it's really just about being alert and being aware of your presence and, and your, your, you know, what you're representing, right? I mean, you have to... Uh, you know, in these areas, it's uh, I've always sought out a very old car, and you know, not to uh, you know, you can't uh, you know, you, you can't dress like I'm dressed right now. You have to uh, you, know, you have to fit in a little bit, and, and and you need to know somebody. You have to have somewhere you're going, and if you don't, you you don't go around the same block more than once. I mean, there's all kinds of little rules. We just have to uh, be very attentive, and and I think it's very important that we 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 don't you know shy away from confronting the reality in these areas because. Um, you know, and now we're finding all kinds of new ways, right? I mean, we can actually uh, telecommunicate with people. So um, this is uh, kind of exciting, although, uh, you know, we'll see where we go with it. Yeah. Ah, hello, we have a question. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, um, great presentation. And I just had a question about uh, the forms of mobilizations that have occurred, if at all they have. You said there's some okay. marches, but what what are the ways in which people are mobilizing or tapping into networks to uh, confront this problem? Is the tactics being used, the repertoire is being used. Yeah, um, I mean, there's there's local activist groups which are uh, very much fighting for uh, environmental um, concerns. Um, you know, and they try to do positive things too. They try to do um, reform. always trying to solve the, the problem and they're always having solutions. I mean, in this area, we have uh, 280 uh, wastewater treatment plants and only like 40 of them are working. And each one of these is something like, you know, 10, 20 million dollar uh, investment. And, and every year we see a new commitment by the state to, to finance these developer groups who come in and they double the prices and, and but the local conditions don't allow these things to move and to, to operate. So we have we have a state that's kind of a, uh, you know, going for the high tech solution. They take in the counselors from around the world and they, and on the local level, it's a continuous uh, fight against the little things, you know. I mean, on this river last week, um, you know, the state was putting in a bicycle trail. I mean, this river, if you get too close to it, you get, you know, you'll, you'll have headaches, you'll have problems, you know. And, and so, you know, their solution is, uh, you know, so, and one of the ways they're going to do it is they're going to cut down the trees. So the local people came out to, to save the trees because, you know, why were you going to cut down the trees to put up a bike path around this river? So, I mean, and people are very much, uh, you know, insanely upset about it. Um, but it's, at the same time, you know, there's uh, the other side, which is trying to attract more industry, to try to grow the economy, to try to, you know, to... to uh, so th th there's a conflict of interest here. And I, I think, you know, um, one of the analyses of, you know, things that occur to me is what happened in, in Russia after they uh, opened up... And, you know, we had this kind of gangster capitalism for 10 years in the 80s and 90s where, you know, it was a capitalism of, of you know, of, at, at the point of a gun. And that's what we see on the local level here. You know, that's what we see is that these large industry groups, they wash their hands of all their problems. They hire the local industry group. Local industry group is in bed with all the bad guys. And, and these guys get their way. And so, you know, we see lots of mobilization. We see lots of young guys who are trying to get involved. But we also see a, a very active state. And, 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 and narco apparatus, which is, you know, in confrontation. And, and I really 
you know, I, I again, I, I participate with a lot of this, but I don't see the way out in a confrontation. You know, we are we do build networks. We try. Um, these guys in the in the local level have have uh, invited the European Union uh, to do a, a, a toxic tour of Mexico, and and they've report, you know, produced lots of documents, lots of uh, statements against you know that the, the human rights are being violated. Um, but it, it, you know, in the end of it, we have the nature of capitalism, right? We have you know, so we can go to these big uh, production facilities and we say you cannot smelter uh, lead here anymore. You have to, you can't do it. So what do they do? They don't do it anymore, and they sh they shop it out, and it, it comes up in a community. You know, it comes up in somebody's garage in a community, and we find out that they're you know the neighbors are are, are dying, and then we shut that one down, and it opens up in another community. So it's really difficult to kind of look at a solution. Um, you know, and, and then from the global side, when we, you know, they've had some victories recently, they've closed down a garbage dump or, or they've stopped a thermoelectric operation, but they just move their territory, right? They don't, capitalism doesn't stop. It just changes its geography. If there's a little resistance, it moves to the other town right across the river, right? You know, if these guys put up opposition and they stop the industrial discharge, the industry opens up on the other side of the river in a new administrative uh, zone. And so it's, it's really like whack-a-mole. And I think what we miss in the end of this is this kind of analysis, at least for me, when, and this is what we do in the communities, is try to give them the analysis that, you know, unless we have a big movement, there's not going to be any shutting down capitalism. What we need to do is look on the local level and really get together with who we are, you know, and, 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 and so on this level, on the other side of what we do is we build filters, we build community water supplies, uh, we build small, small scale wastewater systems. And, and we try to treat this river for, for their farming use as opposed to using it uh, for what they're doing. So I think on the local level, I mean, I'm behind, so I'm promoting my own vision of what needs to happen, which is not very much of a researcher's. I, I, I get tired of, uh, you know, this conversation that, you know, uh, what we have to do is stop the industry from polluting. Well, yes, of course, that's obvious, but that's completely complex. It's not, you know, how do you stop, uh, you know, the Swiss... Uh, empire from investing in other countries you can't and, and and you have on the the higher level you have the you know the presidents and all these guys you know begging them to come right i mean so it's, it's you have both sides and you know of course moving heavy industry out of europe and moving heavy industry out of uh, the united states has been you know ideal for for the european um context right so so I think it's very complex, and I think the analysis has to be very strong on the local level of what what's happening, who these actors are, and that it's transnational. You know, it's transnational in nature. And so, yeah, sorry, that's a long answer. Thank you. Oh, I had a, a follow up question. Um, it may be a, a like naive tangent on on the answer you've just given. But um, have you uh, have you seen any stories where or case studies which are similar in the original problem to the your your current case study that have managed to do some form of just transition away from it? Is and uh, have you seen any solutions in uh, in another context, basically? Uh, in terms of the pollution, or in terms of the bottled water? But, well, yeah, I guess the bottled water would be one that I was mostly focusing on. But if you had an answer for the uh, the pollution, that would also be great. I see. I see growth in all all directions on the bottled water movement, and I see uh, large capital movements in that direction. I see huge investments. You know, I mean, uh, you know, Nestle. You know, they announced they were going to invest a billion dollars in the market, and Coca Cola announces again they'll do it. And you know, and there's analysis on the from Danone, the French guys, who call this the Mexican model. There's a very key part to this Mexican model. Okay, in 2000, uh, the president of Coca Cola, the CEO of Coca Cola, became the president of Mexico. And in this period, we see a huge growth. Right, we see 100 percent per year growth of con con Coca Cola. Uh, in, in this period, right? So, and he named another Coca-Cola executive to be the head of the National Water Commission. Okay, and he, and so I mean, it's it's impossible to take it away from this these 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 little facts. Now, I mean, we see in in I've also done research in Flint, Michigan, where they've contaminated the public drinking water supply for for a, a post-industrial town. Not this, so we have the opposite side. Here's an industrial town that's uh, having problems, and the other side's the post-industrial side, which also has problems. And so, you know, in Flint, we ask people if they're ever going to go back to trusting the public water system. And they say no. And if you ask anybody here if they would trust, you know, if the Mexican government could get their act in order, would they trust it? No. You know, and when we get to the point, you know, water is a really essential element in terms of the trust of our institutions. Right. 
So if you, you know, if you have no trust in your institutions, and if you have no good water, and if you, I mean, it's just, you know, it's so beyond, um, I think that there are solutions on the local level of people providing their own bottled water. Okay, so in some of the communities we work in, um, they don't have good water, they don't have a good system, their wells contaminated, but these these cheap um, water systems to sell bottled water, um, they invest in. And, and in this way, they keep the money from leaving their community at least. Um, but I, I, I mean, I don't want to be, you know, a scary guy. I'm not trying, but, but the Mexican model is now being used in the Philippines and Malaysia and all of Southeast Asia and in Africa. You know, any context where you can think of a weak uh, government arrangement is, is a potential growth market for these guys. And, and you know, it's absurd the, the, the amount of profits which come from, from this system. And it's absurd the number of people who are walking the streets carrying bottles of water up and down stairs and all. I mean, this is this is a crazy modernity. I mean, we're in the, the you know, and, and as Alberto Ars in, in, in Wagenegen always says, this is an excess of modernity. No, we're not suffering from development. This is <laughs> way beyond the, <laughs> the, the need for more development. Anyways, yeah, thank you for the question. I think in terms of the pollution, um, yes, we have many, 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 many examples around the world of, of, of groups coming together to restore rivers and watersheds. Yes, you know, this is this is uh, possible. And this, um, usually it takes some kind of big national outcry and some kind of big event. Uh, but yeah, even in, you know, the Thames, right? I mean, we can start in, in England. 1858, okay, Kier, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Joshua. Um, I had a question which is actually related to what you were just talking about. Um, but I was hoping that you could expand a little bit more. Um, it's interesting what you said about the direction of travel of the bottled water industry, but I was quite interested in what you said early on in the presentation that 80% of water supply currently is provided by smaller, more informal vendors. I was just wondering if you could expand a bit on the nature of the current providers. So. If, are they sort of community cooperatives? Are they linked to larger corporations? Are they? What's the nature of that sort of supply chain, as it were, at the moment? Very nice question. So I, I think this is one of the, you know, um, the, the funny outcomes of, of neoliberalism, right? We don't have predictable outcomes, and so one of the things that we see is that it's not controlled by these big industries, right? These big industries, and certainly in the nice neighborhoods like I live in here, uh, it's only Coca-Cola and the French and uh, the Danum and and Pepsi Cola, who sell us all the water, and they control this area. And it's, you know, it's about two pounds for a twenty-liter bottle, and you know that that has a huge problem, right? Because I mean, if if if, and that's half a day's minimum wage, and you know, most of these factories pay two minimum wages, so it's a quarter of a man's minimum, uh, you know, a, a factory shift uh, for a week. No, sorry, for a day. And um, anyway, so so what happens is that you know, in these areas. We, we see kind of this local movement to to supply the market. We also see intermediaries. So we see these German um, filtration companies coming in and selling lots of, you know, so they're also pushing the, the kind of home uh, solution and the community solution, right? So there's, there's a second side to this market, which is, you know, kind of not the, you know, billion dollar operation. It's, it's a, you know, 2,000 pound operation, which you can sell a hundred of these jugs a day. And so, you know, there's been huge mass marketing, very aggressive mass marketing into these areas to sell this equipment. And they promise that you can make, you know, the most money you've ever made in your life until you realize that, you know, everybody has tried to do it. So, I mean, in some neighborhoods, we have five on a, on a single block. We have, you know, selling water. And, and so it's really become, uh, it's amazing the number. When I first started, I thought there was going to be 30. You know, somebody told me, we think there's a lot, it's grown a lot. There used to be three of these small vendors in the area. Now there's 30. And, and when we actually started to look, we found 80, we found 78 that we interviewed. And um, so uh, we, we looked at their sales, we looked at their knowledge, we looked at who they were, we looked at uh, why they're in this business, their rationale. But one of the, I think, exciting things that we find is that they're not, obviously, not water professionals. They're not big capitalist enterprises. They're just local uh, residents, right? And so local residents, mom and pop water shops, right? This has a very different connotation than, than uh, transnational who drives by your neighborhood and maybe sells you good water and you don't know what the water is. There's no information about quality here. So you, you assess by price, has to be better, it's more expensive. 
Well, these local guys are actually embedded in their community, right? So maybe they're not water experts. Maybe they don't know about filtration. Maybe they're not taking the safety precautions they need to. But when the neighbor doesn't have money and he needs water, he has to go to these guys, right? So these guys are embedded very differently in the neighborhood. They have a very different rationale, uh, a very different relationship. And so it's, I think you know, that we're seeing a real organization of the space, you know, I think, it, and it's moving very, very fast. It's very, very, very fast. It's, it's new entrants and, and businesses collapsing. And, you know, it's a very aggressive little model that's happening in a, on, a, on, a, on a local and national level here. But uh, they sell on credit, one. So this is very different, right? So they're actually providing 60% of these, these vendors sell uh, to their neighbors who don't have cash in hand. And about 50% of them have a politic of uh, giving water to, for free to certain groups. So uh, they know so they have a list, they, or, or it's relations, social relations, or it's children who pass by going to school or need a drink, or it's the church, or it's a community group. And so it, it, it's very different who these guys are. They're very, you know, it's, I think it's an important factor to recognize that these are not the same capitalist model guys who are just selling bottled water. These guys are the neighborhood shop. And if you need water, you knock on the door of the guy's house and he goes out and he starts the business up and he gives you some water. I mean, it's, so it's a very, I, I think it's a good question. I think for me, it's exciting, um, you know, uh, uh, understanding that, that, and I think, you know, there is potential. Uh, we're working with a group recently here who's, who's found very high levels of glyphosate in, in the bottles. And um, so this is, uh, you know, very disturbing. Um, but when we talk to the local community members, what they actually say is that they want to know more details, right? They want to know who's doing it. And not because they want to accuse them, but because they want to go and help them change their filters, right? We shouldn't be drinking glyphosate, right? And we're finding levels, you know, uh, you know environmental working group says we should have five parts per, 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 per thousand million or per billion. And, and these guys are finding 800 parts, you know, and this is, you know, so people are drinking very contaminated water. And there's concern, and I think on the local level, there's there's potential for reorganizing the space, you know, see, with with local groups getting involved. But at the moment, we we find it completely chaotic. We find it very ruthless. We find uh, guys like I've showed you pictures of who are wandering the neighborhoods trying to sell you water. You have no idea where this water comes from. Um, you know, they sell it where the, the water we pay for here is 44 pesos or or 41. I paid the other day, and um, in those neighborhoods, their water is five pesos. And, and, you know, that's about where the margin is. And it's so competitive, you know, um, the prices go from about five to 15 pesos in that, in that area. But it's so competitive that um, they can't raise prices. And so there's actually kind of a, a, an interesting thing going on with the market where they can't even uh, pay their own wages very good, right? And about 30% of these businesses are only bringing in less than 10 pounds in sales a day. And so from that, they have to pay their workers, they have to maintain their equipment, they have to, you know, so this is, it's, it's completely unsustainable on that level. And what we're seeing, I think, is kind of a reorganization of it. But uh, long answer, thank you. Joshua, I wanted to wrap up with a question, of, another question about the politics of this. And I'll, yeah. I'll resist making any uh, connections to the current, you know, political situation in the UK and the way our public provisioning is happening under the current government even though I was slightly reminded of it when you mentioned the president of the CEO of uh, Coca-Cola becoming the president, handing out these deals to his friends. But um, I was just wondering whether the current or the relatively new progressive government in Mexico uh, signals any changes or, or movements in this regard or, or whether but, or whether whether things are continuing as previously, even despite you know, the AMLO government, which has been in power for, I think, two years now. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I, I, I think, you know, we're in the middle of a shakeout and uh, there's, there's a lot of different groups contesting his power. So one of the things that, that AMLO's done is, is raise the minimum um, subsidy for pensions for uh, dependents on the state. And this has, has really created a base of support amongst the most, the poorest. Um, at, the several, at the same level, he's become very authoritarian. Um, I'll tell you, I think I'm, I'm involved in a number of very big projects here that are looking on the national level at how to fix this problem. One of the problems is, you know, uh, creating open access to data, creating, um, and, and what we find, you know, when we're in doing the actual exercise, um, 
you know, this data is not just contested by these state organizations, but it's also contested on the ground by organized crime groups. And, and you know, I went to look for a, a water reservoir about two weeks ago that someone told me was the most pristine in the area. And I said, wow, I want to see a pristine reservoir in Mexico. I've never, well, I've seen it in, you know, in Chiapas and other areas, but around here, never. I, I went to look, there was no, it, it no, no longer exists because the drug gangs have taken over. Um, they, they're, they're armed guards around it. They're actually ex excavating to all the territory and selling the rich for the, the soil for these these housing developments. So it, it, everything's just completely convoluted. Uh, and I think we're seeing kind of an outbreak of, um, well, you're asking me in a very specific moment. Right now we're in election season in, in Mexico. And this is a very, 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 um, you know, highly politically charged, highly uh, contentious moment. Guadalajara ran out of water about six weeks ago. And, and they took uh, drastic steps. They took about 300 very heavily armed policemen to the farm region and they destroyed all the farmers' pumps. They put out outposts in that area and they are now, it's a militarized zone. Um, and, and they're taking that water, that river, that's the most contaminated on this, this area. And that's the water they're, shed, they're sending to 60% of the city right now. And, and people have sent me photos of just horrendous water coming out of their town. It's hard for me to see a solution coming from the top until we get to a narrative which recognizes that public services are part of what makes life possible in a region, right? It's part of the social reproduction of a state has to be the provision of a baseline. And if the state doesn't provide that baseline, you know, trying to fix the data sources and trying to fix the, the security system doesn't mean nothing to me. I mean, it, it, for me at the moment... You know, the, the discussion, I haven't heard anybody saying it on the international or national level. What we need is a complete reinvestment in the public sector to, to rebuild the infrastructure of a country in order to have industrial development, in order to have a society. I mean, that's, that's you know, but we're not seeing it. What we see is, is actually neoliberalism as an increased, you know, presence of the state, right? And we have Adam uh, Tooze's book, uh, Crashed, and uh, uh, Slobodan's book on the globalists. And, there's an, and we can document it in many ways. We've seen an increase increased presence of the state subsidizing this model indirectly through through right they're actually giving 10 times the amount of water money money they give to the federal water agency they're given to the cash subsidies the conditional cash transfer so people can buy this water on the market right so we're seeing a complete shift and a break away from from this idea of a strong centralized government which provides for the people we're seeing a complete twist and you know amlo on the left i'm not sure what's going to happen um i can't predict it's it's a it's a you know free for all here in Mexico and and uh, he's got a lot of opposition you know a lot of the financial sector you know they 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 you know they're very skeptical of him and they're not helping him in any way right so they're you know hoping and they're betting on other groups uh, we've got a couple more years of them so we'll, we'll see uh, right now we're having a big shakeup with the elections and and um, on the local and state levels, but but not not there. But but for me, I don't see anything coming from from AMLO. Uh, I see an investment in these 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 research projects to try to understand the problem better and try to figure out how to make data public. And 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 again, it to me it goes back to this idea: once we can fix democracy, we can have clean water. Well, yeah. So which one do we fix first? <laughs> I'm going for the water. I think we'll have to we'll have to call time there. But you know, this has been it's been really insightful to get your clarity in what it would really is evidently a situation of great complexity. And still, I think you've brought a lot of clarity to it. Um, just saying the way I knew you, I'm sure you'll be happy to have individual follow ups with people if they want to get in touch. I know you as a very approachable and extremely enthusiastic person. I know that's come across today as well. Uh, I'd love to hear more about your ongoing work with the communities another time as well. And maybe we can bring you back for that, possibly in real life when ah, that's possible that's again. Because yeah. I know your mentor, Norman, doesn't live too far away from here either. Oh, I would love to see Norman. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's doing good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, thanks, Joshua. It's been a small crowd. I think it's because of the part of the term that we're in right now and just yeah. how zoomed out everyone is after this year. But it definitely quality over quantity also with your presentation. And, um, well, yeah. Let me just say thank you to all of you and thank you to, to the listeners and the questions. And, and for sure, you know, write me with questions and, and help me orient, uh, help, help me, help orient me. I'm always uh, looking for conversations to help locate this. Thank you, Phil and Andrew, very much. 
Okay, Joshua, take care. Don't go to dang all too dangerous neighborhoods, or at least stay inconspicuous in your old car. And looking forward to seeing you again soon. You too. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone else, for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs>